Hello and welcome. We're glad that you could join us today. We are continuing with session number 60. Can you believe it? Session number 60 of our online Bible study out of the Gospel of Luke. Today we are in Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, if you want to follow along in your Bibles, the Gospel of Luke chapter 19. I hope that you join us each and every week with Bibles in hand and a pen and a pad of paper close by, and you can jot down notes of interest or things that you might want to look up on your own. But today we're going to be in Luke chapter 19. Before dawn on January 17th, 1994, Los Angeles was jolted awake by a giant of an earthquake. For 45 seconds, the titan pounds its fist and stomped its feet in a furious rampage through the city. And as the ground trembled, structures jerked up and down, and they shook apart. Inside darkened homes, people were thrown out of their beds. Chandeliers danced to an eerie rhythm. Refrigerators lurched across the linoleum. Drawers and cabinet doors flung open, tossing their contents onto the floor in a spray of broken glass. Blinds chattered. Walls split. Foundations cracked. And in the aftermath, dazed residents stumbled through the blackness, flipping light switches that didn't work and testing phones that were dead. They wandered outside and waited for the rising sun to reveal the wreckage. And as the earthquake tested the strength of their houses, so the ruins will test the depths of their character. If they have invested their hopes and security in earthly treasures, their lives will be in shambles among the shards of glass. If they have invested in eternal treasures, they will be shaken but not destroyed. They will be able to say with a fellow earthquake victim as he put his arm around his wife, we've lost everything and yet we've really lost nothing of highest value. Well done, good and faithful servant. Perhaps you've heard that phrase before. And it comes out of this parable that we're about to read in Luke chapter 19. This is an interesting parable because it's the only parable that Jesus told that was actually based on a historical event. Before we read it, remember the context. Jesus had visited Jericho. He had healed a blind man by the name of Barnabas. He visited with a tax collector by the name of Zacchaeus. And now he was on his way to Jerusalem. Jericho is about 1,300 feet below sea level. It's the lowest city in the world. And Jerusalem is about 2,500 feet above sea level. And this 20-mile road was an uphill climb in more ways than one because Jesus knew that within the week he would be arrested, tortured, and crucified. We read in Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 11, Now as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Therefore, he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called ten of his servants, delivered to them ten minas, and said to them, do business till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Master, 
your mina has earned ten minas. And he said to him, Well done, good servant, because you were faithful in a very little, have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Master, your mina has earned five minas. Likewise, he said to him, You also be over five cities. Then another came, saying, Master, here is your mina, which I have kept put away in a handkerchief. For I feared you, because you are an austere man. You collect what you did not deposit, and reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, Out of your own mouth I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man, collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank, that at my coming I might have collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by, Take the mina from him and give it to him who has ten minas. But they said to him, Master, he has ten minas. For I say to you that everyone who has will be given, and from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. But bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. Studying a parable of Jesus is sort of like peeling an onion. There are several layers of meaning and application. This parable has an extra skin because this event actually took place. So let's peel the onion and get down to the core of what God is trying to say to us today. In 4 BC, Archelaus, who's the son of Herod the Great, traveled to Rome to be crowned ruler of Judea. Herod the Great, let's just say he wasn't so great. He gave himself that title because he was such a great builder. Herod was the one who had directed the wise men to go to Bethlehem to worship the newborn king and then to bring back word to him so he could go and worship also. But we know that Herod was so jealous, he actually wanted to kill the newborn child. And when the Magi returned without reporting to him, Herod ordered all the boy babies in that region under the age of two to be killed. He was Herod the great murderer. And when Herod died, there was confusion over his will. It seems he had written six different wills, and both Antipas and Archelaus came to, uh, claimed the throne. And so, as in the parable Jesus told, Archelaus traveled to Rome to have Caesar Augustus confirm him as ruler. Now, the Jews were outraged at the prospect of Archelaus because he was as brutal as his father. They sent an official delegation of 50 Jewish leaders to Rome to oppose Archelaus as ruler. Meanwhile, Archelaus bribed many of his supporters to work as his representatives while he was in Rome. Augustus didn't crown Archelaus, instead he made him a ruler of Judea and gave Galilee to Herod's son, Antipas, and the area to the east of the Jordan to Herod's other surviving son, Philip. Now Archelaus was so angry at this the idea of his kingdom being split up this way, that when he returned to Jerusalem, he had thousands of Jews who had opposed him put to death. Archelaus is mentioned only one time in the Bible. When Joseph and Mary returned to Israel after fleeing to Egypt, Matthew 2 verse 22 says that when they heard that Archelaus was ruler of Judea, they bypassed the area and went to Galilee. So this is more than just some fictional parable. It's based upon something that actually occurred. But let's peel off that layer and go a little deeper. Jesus used this actual event as the basis to describe what was going to happen spiritually. 
2,000 years later, the spiritual meaning of his parable, it hasn't changed one bit. Jesus is going to return as king. Verse 11 records many of the Jews thought the kingdom of God was going to appear at that moment. And the truth is that the kingdom of God did appear, just not the way they thought that, that it would. You know, from the very beginning of his ministry, Jesus preached that the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. And he also said, my kingdom is not of this world. In other words, the kingdom of God is not all about human stuff like government or military or the economy. No, the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. And Jesus said that this spiritual kingdom, the kingdom of God, was a present reality in his day. He even went so far as to say in Mark chapter 9 verse 1 that some of y'all standing here listening to me right now will see the kingdom of God coming with power before you die someday. Now, do not miss the point here. Either they actually saw the kingdom of God fully come during their lifetime or some of those folks have not yet died. Have you seen any 2,000-year-old people wandering around? (laughs) Well, preacher, I guess Jesus must have gotten it wrong. Well, that's hogwash. Jesus knew exactly what he was talking about. Now, there are some folks who have ignored what Jesus said, and they are still looking and waiting for the kingdom of God to come. And they're waiting on some pie-in-the-sky future when Jesus is going to come back to earth a second time, this time bringing the kingdom of God with him. You know, we hear a lot of preaching about the great tribulation and the rise of the Antichrist and the desert blossoming as a rose and the battle of Armageddon with human blood running up to the horse's bridles, the future establishment of the kingdom of God with Christ sitting on the throne of David in Jerusalem and ruling the world from a thou- for a thousand years from Jerusalem. Now, they've taken a lot of spiritual symbolism and turned it into literal future world events. And it makes for great science fiction with the emphasis on the word fiction. Please understand the one thing that we all agree on is that Jesus is coming again. Of all the great, dramatic, and memorable events the world will ever see, The most majestic and wonderful is yet to come. It's an undeniable fact that the church, in her present condition, is instructed to look for the return of Christ from heaven as the next great world event. Jesus said, I will come again. He said, they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And John the Revelator added, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they which also pierced him. Now Jesus was born in the Judean hills. He walked the shores of the Sea of Galilee. He ministered salvation to sinful, hungry souls and brought healing to the sick and the afflicted. He carefully informed his disciples of his departure from them, and after his resurrection, he led them out to Bethany from whence he ascended back into heaven. And the disciples were all stunned as they watched him go up. Acts chapter 1 verse 10, And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Verse 11 makes it clear that Jesus himself 
will one day return. It will be this same Jesus who is coming again. Twice in one verse, Dr. Luke uses the idea of the word same to tell us something crucial about the second coming. The same Jesus who left will one day return, and he will return in like manner the way that he left. In other words, he went up through the sky, and one day he will come down through the sky. We might also add that his coming will be sudden and unexpected. Luke chapter 24 verses 50 and 52 informs us that as Jesus reached out his hands to bless his disciples, he began to rise from the ground, evidently without any warning whatsoever. And we can assume that his return will be no less astonishing and no less surprising. This same Jesus, who was born in Bethlehem, is coming again. This same Jesus, who grew up in Nazareth, is coming again. This same Jesus, who turned water into wine, is coming again. This same Jesus, who walked on water, is coming again. This same Jesus, who healed the nobleman's son, is coming again. This same Jesus who raised Lazarus from the dead is coming again. This same Jesus who entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday is coming again. This same Jesus who wept over the city of Jerusalem is coming again. This same Jesus who was betrayed by Judas is coming again. This same Jesus who was whipped and beaten and scourged, and mocked, and condemned to death, is coming again. This same Jesus, who died on the cross of Calvary, is coming again. This same Jesus, who rose from the dead on Easter Sunday morning, is coming again. This same Jesus, who ascended into heaven, is coming again. And that's what we mean when we say that Jesus is coming again. The actual historical figure who lived 2,000 years ago on the other side of the world is coming again. That just sort of blows your mind, doesn't it? Preachers and Bible teachers have for years have searched from one page of Scripture to the other looking for some clue that would show the exact date and the moment of his second coming. These people, however misguided, are right about one thing. Jesus Christ is coming back someday. They are wrong about the time, they're wrong about the place, and they're probably wrong about a bunch of other things. But on the crucial point, they are right on the money. This world's not going to continue forever and ever and ever. History will come to a climax when Jesus himself returns the second time. He, Jesus said, I will come again. One day those words will be fulfilled before our very eyes. You know, it's more than just a song when we sing, The King is Coming. You better be ready. Our source of strength is not in duct tape and plastic wrap, but in our God who has saved us with his blood, sanctified us with his spirit, and wrapped us up in his arms of love. Thank God the king is coming back. When Jesus came the first time, he was the Lamb of God slain to take away the sin of the world. And when he comes back the second time, it will be as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He came the first time as the gentle Jesus, meek and mild. But when he returns, it will be as king as kings and lord of lords. And as the Bible says, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now in this parable, the prospective king gave one mina to ten of his servants and told them to do business until he returned. 
The King James Version says, Occupy until I come. The Greek word is pragmatia, from which we get our word pragmatic. A mina is equal to about three months' salary. So multiply what you make in a month, and you'll see that this wasn't a small amount. Jesus has gone to heaven, but he has given each of his servants valuable gifts. And he has commanded us to do business until he returns to be pragmatic in the way that we manage his resources. Now, don't get this parable confused with the parable of the talents that we find in Matthew chapter 25. There are some similar aspects, but the main difference is in Matthew 25, the master gave one servant five talents, another servant two talents, and the third servant was given one talent. But in this parable, each servant is given the same amount, one mina. The parable of the talents in Matthew 25 teaches us that we have all been given different spiritual gifts and abilities. But in this parable, the gifts that are given are equal, one mina. We all have different amounts of money and spiritual abilities. But what are some of the things that have been given to us equally by God? I can think of at least three gifts that we've all been given in equal amounts. First of all, there's the gift of time. Now, I'm not talking about the length of your life because that varies. But each of us has the same amount of time each day, 24 hours. Even though we have the same amount of time, wouldn't you agree that some servants do a better job managing those 24 hours in terms of doing business with God? What about the second gift, the gift of truth? You know, as servants of God, we all have the same instruction manual, the truth that's found in God's Word, the Bible. God hasn't given me any more truth that is available to you. The third gift that God gives us are opportunities to serve God. All of us have opportunities to serve our master. Some servants just do a better job of taking advantage of those opportunities. They are the ones who will be rewarded. In the parable, when the king returned, he required a personal accounting from each of his servants. And in the same way, we will all give an account to the king on how well we manage the resources that he gave us. In Revelation chapter 20, we read about the great white throne judgment in which those whose names were not found written in the book of life are cast into the lake of fire. That judgment is not for uh, believers, it's for those who reject God's free gift of eternal life. But as Christians, we will be judged. We read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, for we, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body whether good or bad. That phrase, judgment seat, is different from the white throne judgment that we read about in Revelation 20. Um, The word for judgment seat is bima. Now, a bima was a raised platform from which prizes were awarded to athletes who competed in competitions. And the judgment of Revelation 20 is a judgment of punishment for the sin of unbelief. Our judgment at the Bema will be a time when the king passes out rewards for how well we invested the gifts we were given. Now, with that historical and spiritual layer removed, let's get to the core of what God is saying to us. In the parable, there were two categories of people. There were servants and there were subjects. It's also true in this world, there are two kinds of people. 
They're servants of the Master, the Lord Jesus, and subjects who have not surrendered to the Lord Jesus. If you haven't made Jesus the master of your life, the love of Christ constrains me to warn you, first of all, those who reject the king's authority, they too will be rejected. It's not pretty, but verse 27 describes what's going to happen to those who haven't surrendered to the lordship of Jesus when he returns. In the parable, the king executed them. I pray you won't reject God's free gift of eternal life in Jesus Christ. In the parable, the servants represent those of us who are followers of Jesus. When the king returned, he found two kinds of servants. There were two faithful servants who leveraged the king's minus to create more value. They were rewarded. And then there was an unfaithful servant who gave his one mina back to the king. Now, here are a couple of applications for us. If you fearfully hide God's resources, you risk losing them. In verse 21, the unfaithful servant reported that he was afraid of the master, so he hid the money. He was fearful, and his response revealed he really didn't know his master very well. He made assumptions that were not true. He said, I knew that you were a hard man and that you reap what you don't sow. Now, the other servants, they didn't say that. They considered the master to be a fair man who would reward their faithful service. The master replied, I'll judge you by your own words. And he ended up being a hard man to the servant who thought that that's the way he was. What a lesson that is. If you think God is some hateful, evil, cosmic tyrant you will expect him to treat you that way. But if you understand God to be a loving father who is full of mercy and forgiveness, that's how you will expect him to treat you. And according to your faith, it will be so. I wonder how many folks will hang around the outskirts of the church hoping they make it into heaven. But because of fear, or a faulty understanding of God, they never really get involved in doing business for God. You know, when they're asked to sing in the choir or teach children or go on a mission trip, their response is usually, I'm afraid I wouldn't be very good at that. See, they are spectator Christians. And when they stand before the Lord, They expect that he's going to say, well, that's okay. I know that you were too timid, too fearful to really do business for me. Don't worry about it. No, instead Jesus will say, you're a wicked servant. Look at the time that I gave you. Look at the truth that was available to you. Look at the opportunities that you had. All of it was wasted. When you stand before the Lord, he will examine your works. Our management will be tested in the fire of his evaluation. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 12 says the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved but only as one escaping through the flames. Now, some unfaithful servants will be like a man who wakes up and his house is on fire, and he rushes out with only a sheet wrapped around him. All his possessions are lost, but he is saved. What a sad experience it will be for unfaithful servants at that time. The unfaithful servant wasn't rewarded. Instead, the master took the mina away from him and gave it to the one who had ten. And the witnesses cried out, that's not fair. Then Jesus stated a principle in verse 26 that's the basis for what 
the title of this whole lesson today. He said, everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has, or literally does nothing, even what he has will be taken away. In other words, he was saying, use it or lose it. Now, that may sound unfair to you, but that principle is woven into our universe. For instance, it's true of your muscles. Use them or lose them. You know, if you lie in a hospital bed for a week without exercise, you'll lose your strength. Atrophy occurs when muscles aren't used. That's why physical therapy, exercise, and rehabilitation are so important after you've been hospitalized. It's true of your mind as well. Use it or lose it. You know, there was an article a few years ago in the Journal of the American Medical Association about how mental stimulation can keep your mind sharp and in some cases can even prevent Alzheimer's disease. They found that as seniors made the effort to frequently participate in cognitively stimulating activities such as reading books, newspapers or magazines or engaging in working various puzzles or card games and going to museums, it could represent a 33% reduction in the risk of Alzheimer's disease. It's true of your muscles and it's true in your mind, but it's also a spiritual truth. If you don't use God's resources, you may lose them. If you aren't actively doing business for God, you may lose the ability or the desire to do business for God. Are you investing time for God? Are you obeying the truth that he has given to you? Are you taking advantage of those opportunities that he has given to you? But this parable is not about losing it but about using it. Here's the glorious truth that Jesus is trying to communicate to us today. If you faithfully invest God's resources, you'll receive much more. The first and second servants, they were spiritual on, you know, businessmen. They got busy. They invested their mind in doing business for their master. They started with the same amount as the unfaithful um, servant did. But they just did something with their mina while he hid his. Remember, these are resources like time and truth and opportunities. Have you been reluctant to do business for God because you think you don't have enough time? Do you need more time? Here's what you do. Start using the time that you have to do business for God. And soon you'll find you have more time. You won't get 25 hours a day or eight days a week. It will just seem like you have more time. If you don't believe it, try this. Starting tomorrow, just get up 30 minutes earlier and give that time to God in prayer and personal Bible study. If you do that regularly, you'll find that you seem to have more time instead of less time. When you are exposed to the truth found in the Word of God, you can either act on it and obey it, or you can ignore it. And if you don't act on it or use it, you will lose it. You won't lose the Bible, but you'll lose the blessing that comes from obeying the truth. You can't take God's truth and just stick it in your pocket and save it for a rainy day. Maybe you've come to, come up against the truth in the Word of God, and you say, I know that's in the Bible, but I'm not sure that I want to obey that. At that point, you will start going backward in your spiritual growth. But if you obey it, You'll move forward, and you'll discover more and more truth that was there all along. What about opportunities to serve God? Once an opportunity passes, it's gone forever.
If you don't use it, you lose it. These faithful servants didn't play it safe. They risked their lives in doing business for the master. God honors that kind of bold faith. When you risk it all on serving God, even though you may be afraid, you'll find that God gives you more and more opportunities. Life is all about taking the opportunities that God gives us and going for it. There were ten servants in the parable who were each given a mina. Only three reported. Where are the other seven? Where are the other servants in the end of the story? Well, they won't be, you know, that won't be written until we stand before the Lord and he judges us. One day, you and I will stand before Jesus and he will ask you, what did you do with the time that I gave you? What did you do with all that truth? What did you do with those opportunities? God has given each of us an equal amount, one life. What are you going to do with yours? If you give your life away doing business for God, you'll get more life in return. In Luke 6, 38, Jesus says, Give away your life, you'll find life given back. But not merely given back, given back with bonus and blessing. That's out of the message paraphrase. Now what that means is, if you will give away your life as a servant of Jesus, doing his business, you'll receive more life in return. And Jesus isn't talking about living longer. He's talking about living better. Because not only can God add years to your life, he can add life to your years. God is looking for a few good spiritual businessmen, businesswomen, who are willing to risk their lives doing his business. Will you be one? If you will, one day you too will hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you today. Lord, we do pray that we would hear those words one day, good and faithful servant. Father, we pray that we would be faithful servants while we're here. And Lord, help us to look forward to the day when Jesus returns again. Lord, he's not coming to establish a kingdom Instead, he's coming to receive the kingdom that he established on the first time that he was here. Father, help us to realize that as servants of of Christ, we are living in the kingdom here and now. Father, today, we just pray that you would help us to be faithful Help us to do the things and use the uh, things that you have given us so that we too would be faithful. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. This Sunday, Mother's Day, we are beginning a brand new sermon series out of the Old Testament book of Job. You know, whenever we think of a Bible character who had a hard life, we immediately think of Job. And for many of us, we look to Job because our own lives can get difficult at times. And in this series, we're going to look at some of those difficult times. And we're calling this series, When Life Doesn't Make Sense. And I hope that you'll be able to join us for this survey through the book of Job. When Life Doesn't Make Sense. Don't forget, we'll be back next Wednesday morning at 10.30 a.m. for our online Bible study out of the Gospel of Luke. And also, next week, we will be back live, and so we hope that you can join us. Thanks again for joining us today. May God bless you as you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You are loved. We'll see you next time.